Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin speaking to you from Jerusalem, Israel, here at the Temple Institute. Today is the second day of the month of Elul 5781. It's August 10th, 2021. This coming Shabbat, we read Parshat Shoftim, Judges, from Deuteronomy 16, 18. And the Shoftim concludes with Deuteronomy 21, 9. And as you all know, in the month of Elul, every morning we blow the shofar. It's sort of a practice shofar for the big day of the blowing of the shofar, Yom HaTru'ah, the day of the blowing of the shofar, which is Rosh Hashanah. But uh, every day throughout Elul, we blow the shofar in the morning in our synagogues and at home, if you like, uh, as a wake-up call, preparation to get ready. So I'm going to blow it right now, and I hope I don't blow it, uh, here on Temple Talk. Wish me good luck. Well, if that doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will, because it is a penetrating sound, the sound of the shofar. It's a hollowed out horn of a ram, preferably. There are other animals which can be used. We actually have a video on our YouTube channel, um, which I'll be posting soon again on our Facebook page, a video which uh, talks about all the different types of shofarot, types of horns that can be used as a shofar. Uh, last year, I took a trip to the Biblical Natural History Museum in Beit Shemesh in Israel and uh, I recorded Rabbi Natan Slifkin, who is an expert on all things animal-related from the Torah. Fascinating, fascinating museum, and he's put out some beautiful books, uh, many of them in English, really good books about the animals, the kosher animals and not kosher animals, etc., etc. And um, he gave us a long teaching and uh, demonstration on many different types of shofarot, and uh, it's on our YouTube channel. I guess the best way to find it is to, I don't have the title in my head right now, but to do a search on our channel for Shofar, probably a lot of things will come up, but you'll find it, and I will be posting it soon again on our Facebook page and uh, probably sending out a message to all our subscribers on our YouTube channel. But that is the shofar, like I said, preferably a ram's horn, because it was a ram that Avraham discovered when he looked up after the angel stayed his hand. He was about to slaughter his son, offer his son Yitzhak up as an offering on Mount Moriah. And the angel said, no, stop, don't even touch him. That's not what Hashem wants. And as soon as he spoke, Abraham looked up and he saw a ram whose horns were entangled in a thicket. And he realized that's what Hashem wanted. So he replaced his son with the ram and made an offering to Hashem of the ram on this place that became the place of the holy temple, the place that Abraham said, this is the place where Hashem will see and be seen. And by golly, that's what the holy temple is all about being seen by Hashem and seeing Hashem, meeting with Hashem up in the Holy Temple. And so that ram, which replaced uh, Yitzhak, uh, became a very symbolic, and the ram's horn became the choice horn, the choice shofar for, for uh, sounding the shofar on Yom Kippur. I'm sorry, on Yom Kippur, we also sound the shofar at the conclusion. I meant to say, however, of course, on Rosh Hashanah, which is a day which in the Holy Temple was a day which had a few offerings and not many, and it was a day of sounding the shofar. We'll be talking about that more as we get closer to Rosh Hashanah. We're in the month of Elul. It's the second day. We had a two-day uh, Chodesh, Rosh Chodesh of Elul. When it's a two-day Rosh Chodesh, the first day is always the final concluding day of the previous month. And the, fir and the second day of Rosh Chodesh is the first day of the incoming month. Now, of course, as we've been talking about in our previous 
Temple Talk and also I've been posting on Facebook. Uh, Elul is a month of preparation. It's a month of reflection, introspection. It's a month of renewing our ties with Hashem and straightening ourselves out. And yeah, we, we got a little bit waylaid over the past 12 months. We had the best of intentions and yeah, things caught up with us. You know, you get involved with things. You kind of forget. You, you forget to sometimes to keep God present in every moment of your life uh, because God's presence enriches our lives. But we forget sometimes. Uh, so no worry. No worry. We can get back on track. And we have this month in order to recalibrate and reset ourselves and start over again and be revved up and charged up for Rosh Hashanah, the day that we stand before God and and we stand before God as our king, the king who is in charge of everything. Our job is to be thankful for all that we have because it all comes from Hashem. Our job is to be there, be present, be accounted for, be the best we can be. We are who we are. We are who God intended us to be. So let's make the most of it and be there for Hashem. And of course, there's this wonderful concept, Hasidic concept, that actually was taken from a verse in last week's parsha, last week's reading of uh, Re'eh, toward the end of the parsha, when it's talking about going out to war, and it says you shouldn't, uh, if you go out to war against and to lay siege on another city, you should not cut down the fruit trees in order to use them in your weaponry, uh, because they produce fruit, and we need we need the food. It's like cutting off your nose to spite your face. We need the food. And, and, and it goes on to say the next verse, for man is like a, a tree of the field, which is a very enigmatic verse. What does that mean exactly? But uh, from that verse is a Hasidic concept that we are, a fi- we are like trees in a field. And in the month of Elul, Hashem, king, comes out of his palace, comes out of his foreboding palace, off there in the distance, and comes to us, comes to our reality. Maybe I talked about this last week. If I did, I'm repeating myself, and I'm sorry. I'll make it quick. He comes to our reality. He sees us as we are. God is walking. Uh, uh, God as king is walking around, as it were, and he taps us on the shoulder, and we turn around, and oh my gosh, it's Hashem, and look, look at me. How am I dressed? It doesn't matter. God wants to see us as we are. This is who God loves. He loves who He doesn't want us in our see us in our finest, in our, you know, in our, in our Shabbos best, right? You know, in our fine, in our finery, in our fine clothes, with our hair combed back. That's nice. That's nice for us. But God wants to see the real us, you know, with the dirt under our thumbnails, under our fingernails, and we just have to be there. We just have to be present. And of course, it's upon us to do our best, to try our best and to improve and to, to, to make this coming upcoming year a better year for us and to be better people. That's upon us. That's on us. But God, he wants us to be present. He wants us to be alive. That's why he put us here. And being alive means being in touch with Hashem being close to Hashem, being in contact with Hashem. Just like, you know, our parents, it's an old joke, you know, you never call. I saw a, a, a cartoon the other day. It was some people on a beach and there was a, a, uh, an airplane flying by and it had one of those, you know, the messages, the old time messages that they would trail behind the airplane and it says, hi, it's mom, I'm okay. I just want to hear from you. Well. It could be, hi, I'm Hashem. I'm okay. I just want to hear from you. God wants to hear from us. So let's be heard. And by golly, the shofar is a wake-up call for us. And it's also a sign to Hashem that uh, we do want to be heard. We are making noise. We're trying to make contact. And God hears us. Earlier in the day, I recorded with Abba Horowitz uh, the next few sessions of Temple Jam which will be posted on our YouTube channel and also as podcasts. And currently our podcasts are available on Spotify and Deezer and hopefully soon on a few more platforms. 
these uh, temple jam we got a very nice response from the first uh, few temple jams that we that we recorded and and uh, uploaded to YouTube pretty much one after another uh, during the nine days of of Av, the first nine days leading up to the ninth of Av, Tisha Av, Av, and they were focused very much on the nine days and on the building of the Holy Temple, and we answered a number of questions that we've gotten over the years. And so part of our reason, raison d'etre, for the, for the Temple Jam sessions that we're recording now is to answer questions that we often get. And I've been very, um, um, what's the word? I'm trying to think of a word. It uh, starts with an R, but I can't think of it. I've been very poor about answering questions, uh, partly because of, of time constraints, partly because I don't always see the questions. But we're asking people now to send questions, and the best way for me to see it uh, is if you send it via our website, templeinstitute.org. Go to our contact page and send the question uh, that way. That way I will most definitely see it, and I can uh, write it down, and we can address it. So Abba and I, uh, we recorded three sessions. Each th session is between 15 and 20 minutes. And um, the first session, we mostly focused on Elul. And that is, that is live. It will be live tomorrow, actually, the day after uh, the recording and, and uploading of Temple Talk. And, uh, the, second, and the second session will be, we'll make live next week, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in the second and third uh, sessions, we focus them almost exclusively on answering uh, a question in each of those questions that I've received recently. One question was about uh, the temple as described by Yehezkel, Ezekiel. Is that going to be part of the third temple? And uh, we answer that at length. And another question had to do with the with the ketoret, with the temple incense ingredients. Only four are mentioned in the Torah. Where do the other other uh, seven come from? There are eleven in all, and and how are they decided upon? And so there's a very fascinating answer to that question as well. I think that might be our third and our third session. And um, I hope to actually contact the uh, people who send in questions uh, to let them know when their questions being answered. So we hope that you'll send in questions, and. Um, We'll have a very good time uh, trying to answer them, and of course, as we as we uh, proceed and get closer to the holidays, and in Tishrei, the month of holidays, we'll be focusing a lot of our sessions on on the holidays specifically. But we will get back to questions. That's Temple Jam. It's a lot of fun uh, for the both of us uh, because there's a lot of a nice. Uh, back and forth. I'm not alone at the microphone as I am in Temple Talk. We're going to be talking about Parshat Shoftim in just a minute, but I would like to share with you, before that, share with you Psalm number 27, a very beautiful psalm, which we read. It's as actually an Ashkenazi tradition to read it each day of the month of Elul, morning and evening in the morning prayer and evening prayer and on throughout the month of Tishrei, uh, ending with the seventh day of Sukkot. Very be beautiful Psalm number 27. I'm going to read it, the David, and in English it goes like this, by David, Hashem is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Hashem is my life's strength. Whom shall I dread? What evildoers, when evildoers approach me to devour my flesh, my tormentors and my foes against me, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army would besiege me, my heart would not fear. Though war would rise against me, in this I trust. One thing I asked of Hashem, that shall I seek. Would that I dwell in the house of Hashem all the days of my life, to behold the sweetness of Hashem and to contemplate in his sanctuary. Indeed, he will hide me in his shelter in the day of evil. He will conceal me in the concealment of his tent. He will lift me upon a rock. 
Now my head is raised above my enemies around me, and I will slaughter offerings in his tent, accompanied by his by joyous song. I will sing and chant praise to Hashem. Hashem, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious toward me and answer me. In your behalf, my heart has said, Seek my presence, your presence Hashem, do I seek. Conceal not your presence from me. Repel not your servant in anger. You have been my helper. Abandon me not. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. Though my father and mother have forsaken me, Hashem will gather me in. Teach me your way, Hashem, and lead me on the path of integrity because of my watchful, watchful foes. Deliver me not to the wishes of my tormentors, for there have arisen against me false witnesses who breathe out violence. Had I not trusted that I would see the goodness of Hashem in the land of life, hope to Hashem, strengthen yourself, and he will give you courage, and hope to Hashem. It's such a beautiful psalm. I'm not going to get into it anymore right now. Um, there are so many references in that psalm that... that, that uh, a parallel and and re reverberate uh, um, uh, to the to the upcoming holidays. Um, one of the words for shelter is sukkah, which of course is sukkot, um, and the whole idea of, of of taking refuge in Hashem, of trusting in Hashem, and of connecting with Hashem. That's the message of El. That's what we. That's what we're doing here. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, psalm. Psalm number twenty-seven. Have a look at it yourself, and uh, you know what? You read it uh, every day, twice a day, for the next, uh, um, uh, I don't know, 50 days about. Wow, it, it sinks in, it's, it, it burnishes uh, uh, a mark in your soul and on your heart. I just wanted to share that with you. Shoftim, Parshat Shoftim, Judges. We are in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 1. I'm going to read the first few verses in Hebrew, then in English. Uh, chapter 16, verse 18. Shoftim v'shotrim titen lecha v'chol sh'arecha asher Hashem Elohecha noten lecha lishvatecha v'shaftu et ha'am mishpat sedek. Lo tate mishpat, lo takir panim, lo tikach shochad, ki ha-shochad y'aver ene chachamim. V'salev divrei tzadikim, tzedek tzedek tirdof, l'ma'an tichyeh, v'yarashte et ha'aretz asher Hashem Elohecha noten lecha. Judges and officers shall you appoint in all your cities, which Hashem your God gives you, for your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert judgment, you shall not respect someone's presence, and shall not accept a bribe, for the bribe will blind the eyes of the wise and make just words crooked. Righteousness, righteousness shall you pursue, and you sh so that you will live and possess the land that Hashem your God gives you. And then it continues to say that we should not plant for ourselves an idolatrous tree, any tree near the altar of Hashem, uh, your God. That's just why we, there should be no trees on the Temple Mount. Um, there are trees that were planted by the Muslims. They're lovely trees, but they don't belong there. And you shall, uh, you shall not erect for yourselves a pillar, uh, which Hashem, your God, hates, etc., etc. But um, I want to go back to these first few verses. Judges, judges, judges and officers. Um, uh, in the Hebrew, it is sh'arecha. In, in this English translation here, it's, a, it's a described as uh, translated into cities. Judges and officers shall appoint in all your cities. The Hebrew is, is sh'arecha in all your gates. I, I believe that you know, the, the main gate to the city, I believe, is where the, where the judges sat. And people would come to them for judgment. Um, there's a tr this is a very literal uh, verse. And Moshe is telling the children of Israel, he's describing how they're going to live in the land of Israel. This is how you set up a government. You need, a func you need functioning judges. You need functioning courts. The, the uh, Parshat Shof team goes on to talk about prophets, as in uh, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Uh, what is a false prophet? How do you know? And what should be done about a false prophet? And, and, and how do you deal with people who are trying to lead the nation astray to, to worship other gods? and how to recognize that and, and the punishment for it. It's very severe. And how to recognize a true prophet, because Moshe says that God will continue to uh, talk to the people, and he'll do it through his prophets. And you'll know, if, you'll know a true prophet, because what he says will be true. 
Um, and also we learn about kings and about, it's a discussion really uh, that Moshe started earlier in last week's Parsha. He's talking about the Holy Temple and he was talking about war there as well. And uh, he's getting the people ready and he's describing how a nation state will work, how, it's, how the Torah is going to be translated into institutions that will act according to Torah. But there's a very beautiful interpretation of this first verse that uh, is very, again, during this time of Elul, as we approach the Yamim Noraim, the days of awe, being Rosh Hashanah and, and Yom Kippur, when we're standing uh, before Hashem and, and, and accounting for ourselves. These are very serious days, very joyful days, but serious days. Uh, a lot of the uh, sages, they, they give a, uh, uh, an interpretation of verses that we read in our, in our weekly uh, Parsha, uh, which is very relevant to what we're experiencing now. So judges and officers shall you appoint in all your city Sha'arecha gates. And so our sages say that we have seven gates in our body, our two ears, our two eyes, our two nostrils, and our mouth. And we take things in through those gates, and we also let things out through those gates. And we should set judges in those gates in order to not let evil thoughts in, not let evil words in. If someone is speaking Lashon Hara, someone is speaking, you know, bad language about people, saying bad things, we can shut our ears. We cannot listen. Uh, we shouldn't see, we should see everything. There's an idea of this, Ayan Tov, Ayan Tov. We should see things with a good, good eye, meaning we should see the, the best in people. We should see things in a positive light. So we don't want to see things, uh, in a negative way. And certainly, when it comes to uh, our mouth, uh, you know, we don't want to ingest either bad ideas, bad thoughts, or food that's not appropriate. Uh, and we certainly don't want to let past our lips any, any uh, language or words that isn't appropriate, um, that that's, says that's slanderous, or libelous, or puts people down. So, our sages are saying a message here, a hidden message in this first verse, which talks about setting up your judges in the cities of Israel. The hidden message is set up the judges in your own portals, in your own gates, and be aware. Be mindful of all that goes in and out of your portals. And of course, it, it's, you know, it says it's, it's profound things. You shall not pervert judgment. He's speaking of, of the judges, of course, but of course, we can also relate to these things. You shall not pervert judgment. You shall not respect someone's presence. I mean, if someone is a big shot, you know, very important, very wealthy, you, you know, you should not take that into consideration in terms of judging what, uh, over the issue that they're there for. And of course, it doesn't mention it here but in other places it mentions as, as well someone who is, you know, very impoverished or unimportant, let's say. Um, you should not disregard them, of course, and you also shouldn't grant them a, a extra uh, pity, let's say, because of their lower status. You, you're here to judge the issue. And then it says, righteousness and righteousness shall you pursue. In Hebrew, it's, it's, it's uh, tzedek tzedek tirdof. Said it can be righteousness, it can also be justice. And it's repeated twice emphatically th 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 to show how important it is. And then it says, continue of that verse, so that you will live and possess the land that Hashem, your God, gives you. We are here in the land of Israel because God gave it to us. It belongs to Hashem. It doesn't belong to us. God gave it to us. And God has mentioned many times in the book of Deuteronomy, you're here because I'm putting you here. You're here not because you're better than anybody else. You're here. I'm taking the people who away, who were here, because they've, they're have they rotten and their time's up. The land will not suffer their presence anymore. But you're here because I'm putting you here. And you're going to stay here and be here as long as you are righteous as long as you pursue righteousness justice as long as your society that you build based on the torah is one that that is 
is righteous, that is just, uh, is empathetic to its people and to the stranger as well, the non-Israelite. We, we hear that many, many times. Compassionate to the orphan and to the widow and to the impoverished. These people are going to be around. The Torah never says that there's going to be a day when, when there won't be widows or, or orphans uh, or, or impoverished people. They're part of your environment. You have to take care of them. You have to care for them. You have to be mindful of them. And as long as Israel pursues this emphatically, justice, justice, then Israel uh, is secure in its land. It's a big issue. And the issue of, of justice in Israel today is a big issue. And uh, I have to say that in my eyes, and in the eyes of many, our, our judges, current judges, fall short many times of, of what I think is, is justice. And I'm not simply talking about national issues. Um, I'm talking about, uh, you know, issues of, of all sorts of, of, of things that come up. I, I'm, I'm, we need improvement. And we need improvement um, uh, quickly and emphatically because it's such an important issue. It is such a major component of our reason for being here. Uh, if we lose our way, we lose the land. And that is the lesson of that opening, the opening verses from uh, Shoftim Judges. Now, I s mentioned before that the uh, Shoftim then talks about prophets. How can you tell? Uh, certainly if someone is to say, we're going to worship another god. That is definitely a sign that he's a false prophet. If someone says we're going to abrogate, we're going to end, we don't need to do all these commandments, that certainly is a false prophet, etc., etc. But I want to speak a little bit about the concept of the king that you may want to appoint. Chapter 17, verse 14. When you come to the land that Hashem your God gives you and possess it and settle in it, and you will say, I will set a king over myself like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a, uh, over yourself a king whom Hashem your God shall choose. From among your brethren shall you set a king over yourself. You cannot place over yourself a foreign man who is not your brother. Only he shall not have too many horses for himself so they will not return to the people the people to Egypt in order to increase horses, and he shall not have too many wives, so he shall not, his heart shall not turn astray, and he shall not greatly increase silver and gold for himself. It shall be that when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself two copies of this Torah in a book from before the Kohanim Levites. Levites. It shall be with him, and he shall read from it all the days of his life, so that he will learn to fear Hashem, his God, to observe all the words of this Torah and these decrees, to perform them so that his heart does not become haughty over his brethren and not turn from the commandment right or left, so that he will prolong years over his kingdom, he and his sons amid Israel. Okay, a lot going on here. First of all, it's not a commandment to appoint a, ki a, a king. God is basically saying, you may decide you want a king because the other nations have kings. And it seems to you like a fine way to run your country, if you make that choice. And we know that uh, in the book of Samuel, when, when the people went to Samuel and they said, we want a king, he was, he was very upset. Like, you're, you, don't, you don't trust in Hashem, you need a king. But he appointed a king that he, who, he got a message, he got a sign that Shaul, Saul would be the king. And he's the one who appointed. So that's important because he uh, adhered to this uh, concept that when Hashem, your, you shall choose, set over yourself a king from Hashem, your God has, shall choose. It's God's choice. It's not an election. It's God's choice. Uh, but the people then can approve of, of, of God's choice. And he has to be a brother, right? He has to be an Israelite. He has to be part of the tribe. He can't be a, a, a Kohen uh, because they uh, run the, the temple and there's a separation of, of state and, and church, as it were, of temple and, and, and uh, state kingdom. Um, but it can be um, any other member. Of course, later on, it would become the, the house of, of David. 
but at this point, there's no, there's no other uh, uh, qualification. But he's a brother, just like the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, was a brother. The king's a brother. He's one of us. He's not above us. And he's certainly not above the law. That's why he needs to write for himself two Torah scrolls and has to study them each day. And one has to be with him on his person all the time to teach him that he's not above the law. It's not that kind of king. This is no absolute monarchy here. A king has certain privileges that are written into the law, just like a, you know, an elected official has certain privileges written into the law, but the king is not above the law. And of course, these other uh, requirements that he should not uh, have too many horses, of course, horses was, was a sign of wealth, um, and, and, or too many wives, or, or too much money, so that uh, he doesn't wander. Uh, you know, uh, we know that Shlomo, King Solomon, wisest king, wisest man, that as he grew older, he had many wives, and he uh, allowed those wives to uh, set up uh, places of idolatry. He had, had much wealth, and uh, he kind of made some of these mistakes that they're describing here. He started out as a very righteous king, a very wise king, built a holy temple, and after he died, his kingdom was divided because that was, because he had, he had, he had moved, he had gone astray as he grew older. So this is what they're telling us. And of course, this is so relevant to today, whether it's you know, too many wives or an adulterer, God forbid, you know, a, a womanizer who's, who's an elected official, not to mention king, or someone who's uh, just uh, involved with their wealth or their horses, their hobbies, their predilections. I don't know. King has to be focused on upholding the Torah. That's his job. That's it. And finally... But the last thing that I want to focus on in this parsha is when you go out to war. And it says here in, in uh, chapter 20, verse 1, when you go out to battle against your enemy and you see horse and chariot of people more numerous than you, you shall not fear them. For Hashem, your God, is with you, who brought you up out of the land from Egypt. It shall be that when you draw near to the war, the Kohen, the priest, shall approach and speak to the people. He shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you are coming near to the battle against your enemies. Let your heart not be faint. Do not be afraid. Do not panic and do not be broken before them. For Hashem, your God, is the one who goes with you to fight for you with your enemies to save you. Didn't Hashem fight for us with Egypt? That's how we, that's how we were able to defeat the Egyptian army. Hashem is with, the, is with the army of Israel. Of course, when Israel is with Hashem, that's what it's all about. If we don't fear and we stick with Hashem, then we will uh, prove victorious. That's a big challenge for, for Israel. And as we've seen in the history of modern Israel, Israel has fought battles against armies much larger uh, than her and won. So there's no better proof in the modern history of, e of Israel, no better proof to these verses. And then we have the concept of, then the officer shall speak to the people saying, who is the man who has built a new house and has not inaugurated? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the war and another man will inaugurate it. Why? Because he's got something in his mind. He's got something going on in his life. First of all, we don't want that tragedy to happen. Second of all, he may be distracted, and his distraction may cause him his life or the life of others in, this, in, in the battle. And who is the man who has planted a vineyard and not redeemed it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in war, and another man will redeem it. Uh, same reason, right? And who is the man who has betrothed the woman and not married her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the war, and another man will marry her. It's a tragic thing that happens, and it happens in modern Israel as well, and I'm sure it happens in any country where, whose, whose soldiers are at the war. A man is engaged, and he doesn't come back. And finally it says, the officers shall continue speaking to the people and say, who is the man who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, and let him not melt the heart of his fellows like his heart. Because a man who is fearful, who is not up to it, up for the battle, he will have an influence on others, or he may, he may panic, he may flee, he may cause all sorts of, of uh, chaos and endanger the entire army. So, and he's mentioned last, I think the reasoning be, being that uh, while these others are also getting up and leaving, he shouldn't be ashamed uh, by getting up, by admitting that he doesn't have the courage for this. Okay, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for being with me. Temple Talk.